Welcome to the Think MHK podcast presented by the Manhattan Area Chamber of Commerce. On this podcast, you will hear about a variety of local matters pertaining to the business community. You also hear from local business owners to hear their story and gain valuable business insights. Thanks for tuning in today. We have a very special guest with us today, State Senator Tom Hawk, who represents the District 22, uh, which is Riley County and I believe some of Geary County. Is that correct? And Clay County. And some of Clay County. So, Senator Hawk, welcome to the Think MHK podcast. Thank you, Jason. It's an honor to be here. So, our first question is always tell us a little bit about yourself and tell us how you ended up in Manhattan. Oh, it was a miracle. <laughs> I was going to go to KU. I, uh, Actually had a trip to KU um, from Colby originally, and so I got an invitation to go over and visit either a fraternity house or a scholarship house, and I think on my way back through, I stopped in Manhattan. My cousin was going to school here, and he took me to a uh, professor of psychology's class, Roy Langford. I said, oh my gosh, that is the most impressive lecture I've ever heard. And I met the K-State people. This was before Bill Snyder walked around campus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it was the people. And uh, I said, these are the people that are like the people from home that really care about you. Not that the people at KU don't, but it just It's a had, different kind of care. Senator. It is. It's just, that's not the same. It had a positive vibe. And uh, we were also in the final four for the NCAA basketball tournament that year too. So what year was that? Oh, that would have been 1964. Um, so you began your career in education, and how do you think that that has helped shape your political career? It's actually why I decided to run for the legislature uh, for the House in the first place. I was always involved in K-12 education. Uh, I was a math teacher, algebra teacher at Manhattan Junior High, and then I became a counselor. And then I got a job as curriculum director for the central office and spent 33 years of my career, ended as superintendent. Often went to Topeka to, in fact, I was president of United School Administrators, which is a, a global group for principals and superintendents and special ed directors, et cetera. And uh, I was always advocating that we needed to adequately fund education, and we weren't doing that. And so after I retired from the school district, I had some people say, well, why don't you really do something about it? It turned out that uh, there was an open seat that Kent Glasscock had decided to run for governor and his seat was open. And uh, I didn't really pay attention to who else. Unfortunately, one of my good friends and a former school board member was running for that seat also. And I'm just as happy he got it because he won that election. The next time the election came around, he decided to run for his Senate seat, and uh, he said, why don't you run for my House seat, Tom? And I said, well, I'm not going to run against you for the House seat again because I like the job you're doing, and I'm not going to run against you for the Senate. You'd be a great senator. And so that seat was open, and I had a close election, and I actually won. And uh, I found out it was quite a bit different than my previous view of what the legislature was. It's a, there's a lot to learn. And it's not just education that's important, but it was my primary reason for running initially. Real quick, go back. So you you left Kansas State and went straight to uh, USD 383, correct? I did. What What was the reason you decided to stay in Manhattan? I got a job. <laughs> that was it? There was no, because I'm sure there were, somebody like you could get hired in a lot of places across the state. Well, I'm, I'm not so sure. I was, <laughs> actually, I think I was pretty lucky to get hired here. Um, I was active in student government. And I student taught at the high school. Actually, I got into a little bit of trouble, and I didn't even know it till my student teaching was over because the uh, student council uh, was having a little bit of a tiff with the administration uh, about one of their clubs. And they knew that I was vice chair of student senate at K-State, and they came by, the president did, came by to ask me what I thought about that. And I said, well, I don't think it's your decision, but I think that that student government should always have the option to weigh in and offer their opinion. Well, that got distorted and it went to the principal and it was a little, I knew nothing about the issue. It was just a general comment. And I found out that that, that was a complaint against me that I didn't even know about at the time. And they were wondering what, whether they were going to pass me in student teaching. So it turned out when I explained my point of view and found out that I, at least I think I did very well. And I loved my student teaching at Manhattan High. What a great place it was with great teachers. And so when uh, 
a job came open at Manhattan Junior High for a math teacher, I said, wow, I would really like to do that. It turned out my high school principal was the assistant superintendent human resource person. So he knew that I would work hard. I got offered the job and I took it and never, ever really wanted to leave Manhattan. Well, it's good. And junior high teacher is probably one you should you should get hazard pay uh, for, but uh, but you were glad to get it. I was. And I think several people thought maybe that was where my personality got fixated was somewhere between seventh and ninth grade. So I was a pretty good match with the students. And I still have a lot of those students that I am very fond of. Uh, and many of them are here in Manhattan. And I'll mention one of them is Russell Briggs, who is one of my math students that I constantly have to remember that I taught him certainly addition and multiplication. He learned it well. but Pretty let, good at math. But let's work on subtraction and division. Yeah. It's time to trade. <laughs> That's a good point. Um, so I was reading in your bio, you talked about student government, that um, you had helped write the bill for Bill Snyder Family Stadium. Now, of course, it wasn't Bill Snyder Family Stadium back then, but talk about that because I, that, I, I'm interested in, in your role in that process. Uh, it, it was a tough sell, actually, uh, because this was in the late 60s and there was a lot of uh, protests in campuses around the country and a lot of distrust of school administrations. And uh, a group of us on Student Senate said, you know, we need to have a competitive football team or we're going to get kicked out of the Big Eight, and that's going to have a disastrous effect on academics. And we we understood that, but not everybody in student government did, and there were particularly the grad students there did not want to do that. So uh, we said, well, uh, you know, the athletic department needs to build a new stadium. We can't compete in this old memorial stadium. There's not enough seats and it's too old. And if we want to be competitive, we need a new stadium. And we have a new coach, Coach Vince Gibson. And I think we should use the student activity fees to help finance the bonds. And so we agreed to do that. And uh, little did we know that Bill Snyder would be my next door neighbor someday and there would be the hugest turnaround in college football. And and what an impact he's had, not just on K-State and Manhattan and business, but the whole state of Kansas and and the right attitude about what college sports ought to be. And of course, we've had another guest on our podcast, uh, C. Clyde Jones, who was instrumental in helping uh, build that stadium. And he told us the cost of the first stadium versus the cost of the last uh, renovation, and it was just remarkable how 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 difference in cost from the time it was built to. We might have spent more on the Shamrock Room than we did on the whole state. I think that's <laughs> probably right. You talked about winning the House seat, and I believe that was in two thousand four, correct? Yes. And uh, so you started serving in two thousand five, and then you had a stint in the House of Representatives, and then you won, won uh, the Senate seat. And what year was that? That was 2012. I did have a sabbatical that uh, my voters gave me a little time off, and uh, that's the way politics is. Sure. For about two days, I was really uh, depressed about that because I had worked very hard, and actually, I had lost my wife that summer. And uh, so when I thought about it, I said, oh, you know, this is just life. You win some, you lose some, you have your successes and failures. Um the worst thing that ever happened to me was losing my wife. So uh, losing an election is actually a very small loss. And there'll be something else that comes along in the future, and I'm just going to be open to it. And it uh, turned out I wound up getting a job to be an agency head on something else that was a passion for me, and that's mental health. I became the executive director for the Behavioral Sciences Regulatory Board that licenses counselors and social workers and psychologists and addiction counselors and marriage and family therapists. And that was a great experience. But the job came open again. It turned out the person who was going to run for the Senate uh, decided uh, that uh, it wasn't a good time for them at the last minute and they needed somebody to go on the ballot. And I said, I will, but you know, I lost last time. I probably won't win this time. And besides, uh, I think the incumbent is doing a great job, and I think they'll probably win it. And I'm probably going to do uh, one billboard that says I'm probably voting for him, not me. <laughs> <laughs> well, it turned out he didn't win the primary. And so there I was again, and my administrative assistant now said, well, you're going to win this, Tom. And I said, I'm working in Topeka. 
uh, I'm only going to win this if some people pitch in and help. I can't, I can't be around here every day. I'm only here in the evenings and on weekends. And history was there. It was a close race, and I got the job. And that was in 2012. 12. So, and you've been reelected twice. What's the difference in the two houses? And, and what's your experience been in terms of how those houses have operated? Uh, it's quite a, it's it's interesting, and I liked them both. Um, I, I I say it's oxygen. <laughs> There's 125 people in the house to share oxygen and airtime with, and so you don't get as much airtime in the house. Uh, in the Senate, uh, there are 40 of us. We have a microphone at our seats. We do stand up when we talk. In the House, you have to go down on the floor. There are fewer people to share the committee work. And so um, I think the workload is a lot more in the Senate. Um, and I'm not saying the House people don't work hard. but uh, You also they, have a bigger area to yeah, cover as they, well. They do. And uh, the other interesting thing, I think, the Senate is, a, when you talk, is a little more like marital therapy in that the, the, the person who's chair that day, whether it's president of the Senate or some other person, it's passed around. Uh, you speak to them. You don't look at the person that you're talking to debating a bill. Uh, it's kind of a triangle. that You direct that to the chair, and if you don't keep eye contact on the chair, they'll gavel you down. In the House, you're down there standing at the mic, and if you're debating with a specific person carrying the bill, you may be standing right next to them talking to them, and you're looking at everybody in the House. So it, it's a, a different environment. Uh, the Senate is supposed to be a little more sophisticated is maybe not the right word, but uh, the backstop for bad ideas, that's not been the case all the time I've been in the Senate. Several times the House has been the one that has had to stop bad ideas. But in general, we're supposed to be slightly more mature and uh, more statesmanlike. And so in your time in both houses, I think you've been in the minority for the yes. majority, or if not uh, if not all. Do you just got to love being a minority. Talk about the the difference in in um in trying to do this job in the minority versus maybe maybe if the, if you had a majority in in the house that you were serving. It might be easier, but you still have to govern if you're the majority. Um I I think one advantage of being the minority is uh, for the most part, I don't have any votes that I regret because uh, I think I vote. My district is a very um, reasonable district, a very, in, in, a, in general, a very moderate district. And I am a kind of a middle of the road guy. I'm a bipartisan guy. And so uh, being in the minority, you're not really forced to uh, vote with your party. Um, if I vote with my party, I used to joke about it. I said, well, you vote a lot with your party. I said, no, they vote with me. <laughs> the, the frustrating part is there are several things I've tried to do that I wind up getting accomplished. Like the forest, we've, I was just talking to county commissioners today about the Forest Service and wildfire suppression. And it was a real struggle as a minority person to get them to put that extra money in there. Uh, it turned out we had some really bad fires. So I think my... Majority colleagues are happy I got the money in there because we're in a better position to fight those. But you you really have to make good arguments. You have to have a long game view of it. You can't get angry and can't get upset with people. Uh, I don't think that works whether you're majority or minority party. You just can't expect to have the votes. And so most of the time in ways and means when I bring things up, it's pretty much not going to pass. <laughs> But after I have a chance to go around and talk to people and make my arguments and work on relationship building, some of the really important things do get passed. But you have to let other people know that it's their idea too. And I would assume that's probably if you know, if if it's easier at all, it probably might be easier in a smaller body than it would be in the larger body. Or is, or is that maybe not? I, I hadn't thought about that. One of the votes that I had, and and I'm I'm kind of a stickler about following the rules. You know, I was a junior high teacher. If your students don't follow the rules, you have chaos and you're anarchy. Toast. Some days it was anarchy even when I had the rules, but most of the time the, the kids were great. It's it's similar. I, I voted uh, to allow the coal plant to go in out in Western Kansas and Holcomb, the expansion, 
but I got some things that were positive for K-State, were positive for wind energy, were positive for transmission lines. But some of my friends were so anti-coal, they were very unhappy with me about that. Uh, some of my conservative Republican friends, especially from Western Kansas, really appreciated my courage to stand up against the governor and some of the people in my party. But I said, I didn't do it for that reason. I did it because, and it's not that I love coal, it's that I just believed they followed the rules and it was the right thing to do and that we could build off of that. Most of the dirty coal plants were in Eastern Kansas. And I'm still a Western Kansas boy, even I love Eastern Kansas, but I still know where my roots are and I want things to be fair. And it wasn't fair the way we were doing that, in my opinion. So you talked you talked about that particular issue, but what do you consider some of your greatest accomplishments uh, in the legislature? Well, I talked about the wildfire thing. I think that um, this past year, uh, it helps to have uh, budget authority. Revenues were up, and I found whether it's at home or in Topeka in the Senate, when you got money, people are a lot easier to get along with. <laughs> And uh, so we we had reasonable revenues. So getting money for K State and higher ed, and keeping our commitment to K twelve, I think the state highway plan was something that I worked on both committees over a three year period of time. And uh, unfortunately, the previous governor had not funded our highway plan, and our our infrastructure was in big trouble. And we managed to. Uh, hire a great director of our transportation uh, department, and we had a great plan. She was our consultant for the planning of it, and uh, I think that was a huge accomplishment. And then the other thing, we had pictures today uh, that I'm kind of proud of from my counseling days. I had uh, a few students we lost to suicide, and I, I still shed a tear for that. I wished I would know more, could have done more for them, but we established the 988 hotline uh, that was a struggle. Uh, my colleagues thought, why don't we just use 911? Well, that's that's a whole different emergency, very different than getting people the help who you may want to keep on the line to get them through the crisis, or you may want to dispatch uh, mental health services to them, and we need 988. And so getting the money in the budget, I worked hard on that and had to ask my Republican leadership and bless their heart. I respect them greatly because they shifted it from the wrong committee to the right committee, and we got that passed. Well, congratulations. That's a big win. Um, how's politics changed uh, since you joined the legislature first in 05? Uh, there are more skin knees. <laughs> it's a little more combative, and people are a little, uh, little less careful, uh, particularly in the campaign piece of making personal attacks. I don't like personal attacks. I I would like to keep things focused on the person. I think in Kansas, it's still much better than it is on the national scene. But I was taught out in Colby, Kansas, both in school and church and my parents and grandparents to be kind to everybody. And then in the school district, our school librarian, who was a great lady, uh, pulled me aside one day and she said, Tom, be nice to everybody. You never know who your next boss is going to be. That's a great point. <laughs> That is a great point. And some of my colleagues did become my ex-boss and are my best friend now. And uh, we even competed for that job as superintendent at one time, and I didn't get it. But uh, because we were kind to each other, um, he hired me to be assistant superintendent, and uh, we've been fast friends ever since. I had a, a boss tell me one time, be careful how you treat people on the way up because you'll run into those people on the way down. <laughs> That's great advice. That is great advice. So uh, redistricting was this year. Did you see any changes to your district? And what's what's that going to do? to? to uh, yes, I think it's good for our district and the people in Riley County and Manhattan because uh, this Senate district will be just Riley County. We have the popu adequate population uh, to do that. We gained ten to 12,000 more uh, voters or citizens due to the the uh, counting that occurs. And uh, originally, the Secretary of State had to pull those out and send them back to their home districts. And uh, we changed that constitutionally two years ago, maybe three. And uh, so I think that's a good thing. I hate losing Clay County. And that's very selfish on my part. They d I think they're like 10% Democrat. Mm -hmm. So they don't necessarily vote for me. 
but they're wonderful people, and they are so much like my hometown of Colby. In fact, I think uh, the swimming pool that I worked at in Colby for eight years is exactly was built with the WPA money and Clay Center. Same exact design. Now they have a new pool, new pool in Colby too. But anyway, I'm going to miss uh, not representing Clay Center. That could have been something, though, that could have there have been rumors that, that that might look different. And I know from the chamber standpoint, we were advocating very strongly not to split Riley County. And that was, I think, something that might have been on the table at one point. And so we were glad that that didn't happen. I did have an interesting conversation with leadership about that. I made some humorous comments about what some of the district might look like, how maybe it was good if we if we had these criteria about being contiguous and having the same basic interests uh, that maybe the the map that just had Riley County was a better fit and it won't always be me it'll be somebody else I think we have so many good things going uh, credit to you Jason and our chamber our city our county um, and our business people and our educational institutions that and and the support we give to Fort Riley here is we're really a unique community of interest. And uh, I think we've done all the right things in terms of infrastructure and uh, just getting the new business, the Scorpion business and Enbath shows what an incredible future we have here. And um, we've worked hard in the legislature with every governor, whether it was Sebelius or Brownback or Kelly, to make sure that we keep uh, focus on uh, the good things in Manhattan and Riley County. And I, I think that helps having it um, with whoever has a Senate seat focusing on Riley County. I agree. And you, you brought up something that I had forgotten. Uh, but when we had the constitutional vote on the population and keeping students and soldiers where they filed their census, it made an enormous difference for us in a positive way uh, during this redistricting cycle because we have more representation now than we had previously. And uh, as you said, it's we have a Riley County specific senator, and I, th that's a big deal. And so it's something that that kind of flew under the radar at the time uh, because it really only benefited places like Manhattan and Lawrence and and Leavenworth. But that that's a huge win for us, and we're starting to see the benefit of that. I do want to follow up on something you talked about. One of the things that I've always been a big fan of of Senator Hawk is you talk a lot about economic growth and economic development and. And uh, pro-economic development Democrats uh, are ra sometimes rare to find, <laughs> although the governor has been very yeah. pro-economic development as as lieutenant governor. But uh, why do you think pro-growth and economic development um, are important to our region? Well, it, it goes back to uh, my Colby days at the swimming pool. I love teaching young kids to swim. And then I became, I, I was going to go to med school or law school, and I really wanted to go to med school. And I started teaching kids at the Colby Pool. I said, no, you know, I want to be a teacher. I, I've always loved algebra and I love math. And so uh, if we want to keep our young people here, uh, and I really do, I, I don't think there's a better place to live in the world than Kansas. And I think we have the values. I think we have a healthy environment. I think we have people who are generally very easy to get along with, who have a good work ethic. And all we need is the jobs. Well, you don't have those jobs and you're not going to retain people. You're not going to give them the vision that they can stay here when they're young kids unless we have a pro economic growth. And it's no secret that the Midwest has been losing population. I'm still optimistic that as people look at your quality of life in big cities and East Coast, West Coast, and some of the other places, and now that we have the ability to do jobs through technology and and uh, computers and broadband, you can talk about broadband too, but uh, there's just a foundational thing that makes it possible to live anywhere and be economically productive, but you still have to have the infrastructure there, both in transportation and employers and jobs to be able to do that. I, I think David Toland as uh, Commerce Secretary and Lieutenant Governor, along with Governor Kelly, we have a framework for growth, which you helped do, and I remember the meeting we had uh, up at K-State when we went over that. And it had been 28 years or something since we'd done that. Long time. And one of the key things in that is to recruit and retain young people uh, for our jobs. And so we do a super job educating kids. Uh, I want that investment to pay off and it only pays off if we have good economic development. And I know sometimes people focus on things like Scorpion and 
sort of the big wins, but sometimes it's the small uh, issues that do the most good. And um, I do want to make sure that people understand um, during the pandemic, we had a challenge. A lot of our companies had challenges uh, with truck drivers and they couldn't find places for people to test. And they called us and said, we don't know what we're going to do. We may have to shut down. And 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 we picked up the phone and I said, well, let me, let me try Senator Ock, see if he has any ideas. And I mean, literally it was just a day or two later that they got in contact with the state office and they were able to get their folks in to test. And those are the kind of things that keep businesses open and keep businesses growing. And and I just want to tell you that publicly, how much we appreciate you always being available to help our local businesses. And I think it matters quite a bit. So thank you. We appreciate that. So last uh, question is part of the formal interview I have, then we're going to get to the rapid fire. So <laughs> the uh, always popular rapid fire. Um, if you could wave a magic wand and change one thing about Kansas politics, what would that be? I would make it more bipartisan. And, and I think it's fine to be in the teams. And, and I'm a competitive guy. I, I went out for K-State wrestling. I wasn't very good at it. Better in intramurals. That's not, you're not, that's not the reason they killed the program, is it? Uh, it could have been. Oh, no. okay. <laughs> all right. Just check. No, it really wasn't me. But uh, I, I think we all love sports. And uh, I think politics has been become too much like sports where people support their team no matter what. And I understand how that works in sports. But uh, I like a metaphor. I think once you get elected, it should be the all-star game. And we're all on the same team. And I think the, uh, the competition extends past the election. And I think the elections get too, uh, as we talked before, uh, get too personal where they ought to be focused on issues. And uh, I, I believe democracy is the one thing that makes our capitalism and our business work fairly and work well for people and it's why people want to come to this country. But if we lose democracy and we lose that component of treating people well, then we, we don't have the prosperity that we all want. We don't have the opportunity to grow. And, and so if I could wave my magic wand, I, I would say, hey, time out. Let's remember that we should be more bipartisan. And we have a Kansas Civility Project that we started in the legislature. And and I would hope that we would keep that program going. It, this is an election year, so it didn't do as well this year. But we had a couple years where it was really doing well. And a lot of legislators were coming. And we got to know each other on a personal basis. And that's what I love about the legislature is regardless of party, we have some really great people who care about other people and care about their state. Uh, it's, just when, it's just when we get into those Democrat and Republican teams and that becomes primary that I don't think we do what's the best for our children and our, our state and our business. I think you bring up a great point because it felt like 20, 30 years ago that most elected officials, once they got past the campaign, still felt like they represented all of their constituents. Um, and the term that we hear now is, well, elections have consequences. And it didn't used to be that way, right? It, it, yeah. it used to be, let's discuss this at election time, make our decision, live with the consequences of, of who wins, but that the elected official understood that they had to represent their entire district, not just the people who, in theory, voted for them. So. When you asked me about the driver's license thing, I, I don't know what the the party affiliation is of the people who are having trouble getting their CDLs. They're my constituent. Uh, if I have landlords that have problems, I don't, I don't care even if they supported my opponent. It's my job to help them as best I can. I wish I could do better. I don't think that makes it. Once the election's over, I don't think it makes any difference what a person's party affiliation is. If they need me to help them with a the bureaucracy, I think that, in fact, I enjoy doing that more than I do sitting on the Senate floor listening to people give their long speeches. And I think we're fortunate in Manhattan that most of our elected officials feel that way. So Absolutely. And that's why we, I think we're able to get things done. So thank you for that. So we are now moving on to the rapid fire section. We're going to ask you 10 questions. And so answer to the best of your ability, but they're all about you. So we can get to know Senator Tom Hawk a little better. So number one, something people often find surprising about you. Uh, I think they uh, found it surprising that I was a businessman in addition to an educator and that I had a party pick internet photography business that I did in Colorado, Kansas, uh, Missouri, Oklahoma, and California. 
you did that what what period of time? About 40 years from okay. my second year of teaching up till about 10 years ago. A lot of business experience and, and that helps, Learned comes in handy. Best piece of advice you ever received? It, it was from one of my uh, photographer people that actually did the lab who said, uh, you know, people will like you, Tom, if you just tell them what they want to hear. But if you want people to respect you, you have to do what you promise to do. That is good advice. Uh, what is your favorite holiday? I love Christmas. That is the answer for most people on this. I have four grandkids now, and bless my wife, Diane, uh, my, my beautiful wife, Tammy, that I lost, gave me two wonderful boys, and my wonderful wife, Diane, gave me four grandkids, and it is, it is unbelievable to watch the magic of Christmas. I agree with that as somebody with four grandkids of his own. So what is something you would like to try, but you haven't had the opportunity? Oh, I would like to travel more. And I actually have had the opportunity, but uh, I love seeing other places and seeing the world. And uh, I did promise Diane when I proposed that we would do a lot of traveling. And this uh, Senate job has kind of gotten in the way of that. So I'm going to make good on that promise here. Soon. So not enough opportunities. Is she going to hear this podcast? Um, Maybe we, we should we wait hope a year. So. Yeah, we <laughs> hope so. What advice would you give the 19-year-old you? If it looks interesting, do it. And uh, I think I was worried about, you know, what am I going to do for a career? And and what, what if I'm not working hard every day? And there's nothing wrong with working hard every day. But uh, I think as I've gotten older and I've applied for lots of jobs and gotten about half of them, if, it, if it's interesting, go for it. Try it, because nothing is forever. I agree with that. What three words describe living in Manhattan? Oh, um, friendly. We have some of the friendliest people. Goes back to that campus visit, right? It does. Pride, because I think people in Manhattan are very proud of our town and K-State especially, and I think they're proud of our military. And that's something that has gradually improved over the years, thanks to our chamber to a large degree, I think. And uh, I like the man happiness. I think and you don't go many places where you don't see people smiling and laughing and enjoying each other's company. Best childhood memory? I have a lot. I, I was so lucky. I had a wonderful mother. Uh, my dad worked hard, so he was a model. He, wasn't, he was always working most of the time. And uh, I think just being there and my grandparents lived there and I, I think one of my best memories was riding my bicycle up to my grandmother's house when I was about, the first time I got to, to leave the neighborhood, she was like six blocks away and it was uphill and she gave me a lettuce and mayonnaise sandwich. <laughs> I don't think we have enough lettuce and mayonnaise sandwiches anymore for kids and, and sometimes they don't get to see their grandparents on a regular basis. As someone whose grandkids live a long ways away, I agree with that. Who is someone you look up to? I got two people I want to do. I told you the the professor that um, I went to his class and decided to come to K-State on that basis was Roy Langford, and he was an outstanding, honored professor at K-State, but also became a good friend. My cousin lived there, and they kind of took me in when I was homesick as a freshman and gave me home-cooked meals and talked to me. And I think the other person is Bill Snyder, who was my neighbor for about 25 years at I just think um, one of the things I noticed Bill does that a lot of important people don't do is he attends to the people he talks to, is that he is genuinely interested. And in, in, in my political environment, I notice that you may have a great conversation go with somebody and then some other constituent or important person comes along and the next thing you know, that person is flitted off to the next person. And I've noticed that Bill has a, a wonderful heart and uh, incredible skills and and what success he's had, but his core is a, a concern. When he says he came for the people, he genuinely cares about everybody that he's in contact with. And, and wins a lot. Yeah. Texting or talking? Obviously, I'm pretty mouthy on this, so I love talking, but I think texting is so much more efficient, and I'm getting better at communicating with texting. So who is the first person that comes to mind when you hear the words successful business person and why? Bob DeBrian was one of the, he was my vice principal and he moonlighted and I actually kind of modeled my little photography business. I remember going to his house once and he had a desk and a home office. And I said, well, someday if I get my photography business going, I'd like to have a home office and a desk. And, and Bob has done remarkable things 
with his business and particularly what they're looking at uh, is it the light museum mm-hmm. that, art museum of art and light and uh, you know he's he's also been a person who's believed in manhattan and contributed i think of him but the other person i thought of that isn't exactly a businessman but in a way he is because everything's his business and that's c clyde jones and he supports every business and and every good cause in our town and i think that's the other piece of what is a good business person they're not just their business but they're also invested in the community and making other people successful. And so we obviously consider C. Clyde a business person, honorary business person, if nothing else, because of his years of service to the School of Business at Kansas State. And, and of course, he's a former chamber chairman. And, and uh, we named our volunteer of the year after him. So uh, if, he's, wise if he's not a business person, he, we, we, he's definitely an honorary business person at the chamber. So, Senator Hawk, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for your service to our region and our community. And, and uh, we look forward to, I do real quick, you're, you don't have an election this year, so you're, Yay. <laughs> otherwise you probably wouldn't be able to find time for us. So enjoy the year off and uh, we'll look forward to talking to you again, uh, hopefully before, but definitely once session gets rolling. Well, I hope we can do that. And I want to put a plug in for Next Gen Under 30. That's my big project uh, now to recognize young people under 30 and let them know that we care about them, appreciate what they've done. And Kansas is a place for them to stay. And you also, uh, since we're in the Ad AstraCast studios, uh, which is Dave Lewis's shrine to podcasting, you uh, you have your own podcast. Correct? I do. Yeah, you want to you want to plug that real quick? Oh, I do. And Dave has to remember it. It's uh, called Senator Hawk Talk. I finally got it right, and it's not a blog; it's a podcast. It's a Dave podcast. Dave has had to educate me, and he is so much fun to talk to. Not quite as much fun as you are. Oh Jason. no, Dave! Dave is much better at this than I am. So. It's an honor to be a chamber member. I think I've been a chamber member almost 50 years, but I'm not sure. We need to check that because if that's the case, then you'll be entitled to an award. So thank you again. Thank you. And uh, we appreciate all you do. Thanks for listening to this episode of Think MHK, a podcast produced by the Manhattan Area Chamber of Commerce. If you enjoyed the Think MHK podcast, we'd love for you to subscribe and share it out on your social media channels. Feel free to reach out to us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram at the Manhattan Area Chamber of Commerce.